the fact of the matter is, is that the supply chain right now is incredibly constrained, okay? Containers cost more money than they ever have. Uh, trucking is costing more money than it ever has. Um, uh, to get things moving around is harder than it's been traditionally. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is senior editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Todd London and Mike Glowacki of Sherwood Lumber, a building materials wholesaler headquartered in Melville, New York. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Gentlemen, thanks very much for being on the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you uh, Todd, much, if you don't, you're welcome. Todd, if you don't mind, can you please tell us what you do for your company? And can you tell me about what your company does? Sure. So uh, Todd London, Senior Vice President uh, for Sherwood Lumber. I oversee the sales and the marketing for Sherwood. Uh, Sherwood's a two-step distributor. Uh, we focus primarily on two kind of market segments, uh, one being lumber, which we uh, distribute nationally, and the other being exterior building products and outdoor living, which we do regionally in the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Tri-State. So when you say two-step, uh, I'm guessing that means that you sell to uh, other companies that then sell to end users, right, to contractors. Is that right? That, that's right. So our goal and our customer would be the lumber yard, the one step uh, of the uh, of the Northeast region or the Mid-Atlantic region or the Tri-State region. And what do you do for the company, Mike? So Mike Lowacki, I'm the manager of specialty sales. I kind of help run the exterior and outdoor living products for Sherwood. I manage uh, the nine to soon to be 11 sales reps that we have that are in the market every day, uh, helping with them with uh, talking to contractors, helping them talk to dealers and kind of help solve a lot of problems. And uh, you guys are primarily doing uh, work in the in the Northeast. Is that correct? So, from a lumber perspective, we'd be selling across the United States. From an exterior building products perspective, that would be the Northeast, Mid Atlantic, and Tri State. Yeah. And can you tell me some of the companies that our listeners might be familiar with that you uh, sell to? Uh, that we would sell to, as far as customers that we might sell yeah. to. Uh, so sure, we'll sell to your national one-steppers, your you know ABCs, your Beacons, your SRSs, your uh, Allies, you name it, any, anything like that. Uh, and then your large uh, lumber yards, your 84 lumbers, your Carter lumbers that you might be familiar with. Uh, but we also sell to the independent lumber yard names that maybe you might not be as familiar with that, you know, really kind of make uh, uh, building products kind of fl uh, flow and function. Can you tell me very specifically what you guys sell? Uh it's both like commodity type products and it's also manufactured products, if my understanding is correct. Yeah, so we think about our business in two business units. Uh, on the commodity side, we think about our business uh, through our distribution. That's wood that we're gonna hold and transport on the ground. Uh, we think about it through our brokerage business. That's, that's wood that we might not touch. And then we also offer some forward pricing uh, where, you know, we are offering locked in pricing for an extended period of time where the dealer can take some of their risk off the table and, and guarantee and lock their profits in, which as you can imagine in 2021 and 2022 <laughs> has been a super valuable, uh, tool seeing how volatile the market's been. And then on the other side of the business, we run a specialty business. And for us, what specialty means is exterior building products and outdoor living solely and specifically, we want our team to be uh, subject matter experts in the space. So that's siding and decking and railing and stone veneer, PVC trim, pretty much the way I usually put it is if it makes your curb appeal nicer or it makes your backyard look a little bit cooler, that's what we want to dabble in. So I'm guessing business is booming since the pandemic. Is, is that correct? Yeah, uh, building products. <laughs> building products yeah. was certainly uh, something that took off during the pandemic. Were you guys expecting that when this thing was unfolding? No. Uh, when so so um, when um, when COVID first hit and the market was dropping to zero, I think you know we were seeing lumber yards emailing us daily saying that we're furloughing our employees, we're shutting down our doors temporarily. Uh, it was chaos and confusion. I think that's probably part of what set this thing ablaze is that no one was prepared to have the inventory for what the market was about to demand. But uh, no, we, we didn't anticipate what took place. So what has been, yeah. 
Oh, go ahead, Mike, please. Yeah, I was just going to kind of add on to that a little bit. And I think that when the the pandemic first hit and that knee-jerk reaction happened, I think that kind of set a lot of craziness in order, right? And then the more and more that people realized that they were staying home and, and wanting to use the space that sometimes, like, you know, a lot of the American families now are not at home, like uh, 75% of the time, and they use it for, for short-term sleep and then back to work or running around with the kids or whatever. So, like, once that dust settled and they realized that, like, hey, we're here now, we're not necessarily going to be... Um, we're not necessarily going to be traveling or, you know, having people over. Let's make our space nice. And that's where we started to see the, the real kind of eruption and, and, and been carrying us through since then. I'm guessing both of you guys had your uh, work life uh, changed quickly by COVID, right? I bet you were spending way more time at home than you would have been ordinarily, right? Yeah, 100 percent. I think uh, with, with myself specifically, I'm probably on the road three nights a week. So the, it was a culture shock and it was good to be home and, and good to be able to, to, to spend a lot more time with the family and in my own space. Like I'm, I'm subject to it just as much as everybody else. I redid a kitchen, I added a deck, like all of the things that a lot of people were doing. Um, and it, it was good. And then it, we quickly found out that we had to figure out how to continue life and, and work and supply need and, you know, help facilitate demand. And uh, from, from a different perspective, because it wasn't like pounding the pavement and being out in the streets and, and having like your traditional meetings. Um, so did it, it take, did it take it was, a long time to adapt your work systems to deal with the new reality? So Sherwood prides itself on being like pretty nimble. Right. So we, we came out and we tried to be pioneers in terms of the marketing effort that I'm sure Todd can kind of shed a lot more light on to be able to kind of help quell the craziness. Um, but in terms of getting us up and running, like our IT departments and, and that nimble nature of, of the Sherwood culture had really been able to kind of adapt pretty quickly where we were able to do exciting things like aggregation events to help with customer education, um, which then so helps instead of going on a, when, on a call to a, a yard or what have you, you could do these things virtually like all so many meetings uh, have evolved, right? That's, that's exactly right. So what has been the most difficult thing to get during the pandemic for your company? I mean, the, the fact is, is that uh, building products, generally speaking, have been pretty hard to get now. Across that, the board. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, that comes in very. So, um, so um, if you look at the, the manufactured products, uh, you would have seen uh, PVC resin manufacturers declaring force majeure. Uh, so that caused havoc on PVC products. Aluminum became very, very hard to source. Uh, middle of uh, last year just became really, really hard to get your hands on. Uh, composite decking has gone absolutely nuclear. Uh, and uh, is that because of all the people building decks, or is that like manufacturing difficulties? Or yeah, I both? think I think it's a couple of things. So so uh, first, it's an inorganic dynamic, right? So the first thing you have is COVID hits, and what do you do? Well, you cancel a couple of your vacations, and so now you got disposable income. And you're being reinforced that it's positive. It's more positive to socialize outside. And so you're probably looking at your backyard a little bit more. Meanwhile, if you look at the decking market, the predominant share would be pressure treated wood. And that's going sky high in terms of uh, uh, price points because of what the lumber market's been doing. And so now you have what would be the biggest piece of the pie shrinking that that portion of the pie being gobbled up by uh, by more durable greener, easy to install products that once economically didn't make as much sense that now automatically make a lot more sense. And as you're a saying result, that the two products are more cost competitive all of a sudden because of the lumber market going off the charts. Yeah. yeah. yeah and, and there's this unsatiable demand to want to be able to socialize in your backyard. Uh, mm -hmm. So just outdoor living, backyard living in general, I think if you were to look as a segment has really, really like anything that goes in that segment, uh, stone, uh, uh, fireplaces, stone veneer, uh, decking, railing, you name it. I think homeowners are, you know, they're, they're sitting in their backyards looking at it more. And I think when you, when you do that, you start to ask yourself, you know, oh, I can update this and I can update that. And the funny thing about remodeling is, is that like when everything's the same age, it looks okay. The second you fix one thing, everything else looks old. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden you're in this remodel mode. It's a vicious cycle. I can tell you firsthand. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so 
I know you guys do a lot of these products related to this outdoor living space. Can you talk about what you sell to dealers as part of that? You mentioned railing, specifically what are the products? And it seems to me like that business has grown over the last few years outside of COVID uh, before it really took off. Can you talk about either one of you, Mike, you haven't uh, said much lately uh, about the growth <laughs> in that segment? Uh, in, in the outdoor living segment? Yeah. Or specifically the decking and railing? Whatever. Okay. So... The, the decking and railing segment are, are a lot of contributing factors to what we've been talking about, like through the pandemic, staying outside, social distancing, et cetera, right? But I think what you're noticing a lot, too, is the, the newer generation that's coming up are looking for, for ease of life and low cost of uh, ownership, right? Total cost of ownership. And so they're, they're out in this space looking at it like a traditional wood market and saying there has to be a better way, right? Like, for example, my wife and I were just in in the market for some things and and we just kept saying to ourselves like there has to be a better way so one of the products that we offer or both of both of our all, all of our product line to be honest but some of them most of them tell a really compelling story right and so that's what we're really looking for so whether it's a composite decking that doesn't get hot whether it's a unique color palette from a pvc line or the the durable nature the low maintenance cost the the, the strength of aluminum railing that's where we've been able to kind of sell our, our oats, if you will, um, and kind of really latch on to that. So like if you look at the composite decking, if you're looking at it compared to pressure treated wood, one of the first questions that comes up is, is does it get hot? And so we went to market. We found a really strong partner in Moisture Shield with their cool deck technology. And the, here we are today, fast forward two years, and it's 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 one of our strongest lines and, and one of our best partnerships. Hmm. Is the... Uh trajectory expected to keep like uh growing that segment is it are you expecting that these things will like continue to eat away at the wood railing and wood uh, decking product lines yeah for sure um so if you're looking at the uh, consumer uh the recycled plastics market right well we're, we're seeing like a bullish trend for probably at least five to six years and and the reason why is is because of the fact that they're more sustainable in terms of their recycling products and, and, and being able to kind of preserve what we have on earth, right? Like that's a compelling story. Uh, the low cost of, of maintenance, nobody really wants to spend a Saturday or a weekend or multiple sanding and staining and painting decks. Um, the aluminum railing is something that is, is going to be standing the test of time. So your fade resistance is a lot less. You're not going to have warp ballast. You're not going to have splinters for kids. Um, what, one thing I think about in those because, products too, is that, um, those are like tested. They're load tested. You know, a wood railing can be built many ways, many of which are probably structurally unsound. But the, if you follow the directions on those manufactured systems, it's pretty reliable. Am I right about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the other thing that we're probably not pointing out here is if you look at like the segmentation of like where Dex goes on, for example, it's very, very small in the new construction space. It's not as if a builder is choosing to put a deck on a home where you're typically seeing most of the decks going is in that remodel segment. So now mm -hmm. you have the homeowner as the key decision maker where the deck is probably like the sole portion of the project. It's the star of the show. And the funny thing about decking or siding, you know, I've always said, um, you know, decking and siding is kind of like diapers. In the sense that, like, I've never had uh, I never had a need for diapers until my son was born. All of a sudden, I'm thrust into the market. Now, all of a sudden, I say Huggy or Pampers, right? How do I get How do I get people to think that way? It, it develops as a as a need. You're thrust in, and then you leave the market, and you might never come back. So you're like a highly uneducated buyer. So what's the aggregation point? The aggregation point is the contractor. And the more that this has inorganically pushed contractors towards composite, this is what they're going to continue offering to customers as we go along. So there's a little bit of an acceleration from that perspective as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so as an overall result, what you're seeing is, is you're seeing, you saw, you saw composites gobble up a lot of market share from, from wood over the last two years, and that begets itself. And so I think in addition to what Mike said. Because, what, because Mike consumers said, are now knowledgeable about these other products, is that? Right. And, yeah. and, 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 right, that's right. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a little bit of it, and there's a little bit of an element too of people being able to lean on experts, right? So like these manufacturing companies that are producing composite material are in the space; they eat, leave, live, eat, live, and breathe it, right? And so when you have that kind of forethought into it, whether you're buying a pressure treated two by four to make a railing or something else, you don't know where that's necessarily going to go. But you look at testing, and you look at loading, and you look at code, and that's why Westbury's come out with their vertical rail, right? 
Cable rail has been very popular for a long time. It gives a modern look, but the the, the horizontal rail is potentially a hazard. And so they've come up with the vertical rail and, and things that are not necessarily in the back of the uneducated consumer's mind, to Todd's point, is something that can be brought to light when you have a conversation with someone who is, is in the space dedicated 100% of their time. You guys alluded to it earlier, but so these engineered siding products that you sell are gradually taking market share or maybe quickly taking market share of other products. My understanding is that vinyl is still the biggest uh, seller with regard to exterior cladding, but these engineered products are gaining ground, right? Yeah, see, to to say the least, absolutely. Um, It's again, I think a lot of total cost of ownership conversations that we have right? In terms of never needing to sand or stain or paint your house again. Um, and is that I really the case that, with these things? They're, they're pre-finished and you, and you shouldn't have to re- recoat them. Is that true? It, yeah. So some of our products uh, have a painted surface that's warranted for 25 years with our mm-hmm. KWP product. And then Everlast has a lifetime warranty against fading, which is basically unheard of. And so you look at the, the chemical compositions of them and they're standing the test of time and they're doing all of the data testing to be able to make sure that they're there. And so between the seasonal onslaught of the elements that siding bears every single day, whether it's freeze thaw cycles, whether it's in, you know really aggressive UV exposure, things of that, that degrade siding for a long time. Now with the technologies that we have, we're able to kind of reinvent these things through composites and be able to help them stand the test of time. Hmm. If you look at the siding market, just to compound a little bit, uh, you would be right. I agree. Vinyl is definitely uh, vinyl is definitely the market, uh, the largest piece of the market pie, and that and that um, that varies geographically to how to what size they are. But but generally speaking, that, that rings true. I think what you're seeing is a trend. Uh, I think that you're seeing uh, hardboards starting to creep down the cost of uh, uh, what a home is what, what it used to be able to go on to a cost of a home. So. Maybe you only saw hardboards going on homes between seven fifty to a million dollars. Now you're starting to see six fifty, five hundred. That's all. That's all eating away at market share vinyl, right? So that's the first thing. Um, if you're looking at like what's our, what are disrupting siding products? Uh, yeah, there's no debate about it. If you look at the, there's the two products I think that we're seeing the most dynamic growth with right now are engineer wood siding and uh, advanced composite sidings, and I think that's happening for probably two reasons. Um, the first reason is, is that before there was this whole supply chain disruption, you know, did you guys remember what the biggest problem we were talking about was in the, in the, uh, in the industry it was qualified labor. Uh, it was really hard to find, right? Because it's worse now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, all, all these problems have gotten worse and worse. But if you think about it, we had that big housing bubble in 2008, a lot of trades, people left and never came back and demand has gone up, up, up. Right. And so you have this installation kind of gap. And so products that have a really compelling ease of installation are going to find favor with the trade. There's no debate about that. And from a hardboard perspective standpoint, engineered wood siding is easy to cut. It's easy to hang. It looks authentic. It comes with a great warranty. It's pre-finished in the areas that it needs to be. That's really compelling. For the first time in a long time, we're seeing engineered wood siding displacing uh, uh, the, the market leader in a lot of instances, which tends to be fiber cement. In addition to that, the other disruptor that we're seeing that, I'm, that we're really bullish on is this advanced composite siding, and these are. Can you tell me, uh, Todd? Like, w- what do you mean by that? What what are the what is the material made from? Advanced it's, composite. It, it's a it's a calcium composite uh, uh, based product. So um, uh, I think a lot of people call it like PVC siding, but it's not quite PVC siding. Uh, so what you're seeing is you're seeing this product that looks authentic in design. It can be installed to the roof line or to grade. Why is that? Because it's impervious to water, which, to be quite frank, is one of the hardest things that siding has to go through. That's yeah. that's what all layered siding really struggles with, which is why you typically see the you know six inches at the roof line or the two uh, or, or the six inches at the grade and the two inches at the roof line. Excuse me. Um, and and then the other thing that these advanced composites have done is they figured out the formula in terms of not having a massive expansion of contraction, which is the problem most highly associated with PVC. And uh, and so we're really seeing Michael Michael mentioned Everlast. There are some other brands out there that try to compete, but we're seeing tremendous growth in, in products like this because they're green, 
they're more durable than what you can uh, you can get on the market and the ease of install is there and when you can find a product that that has all of those three things plus looks authentic you have a winning recipe to kind of disrupt the industry we'll be back with more right after this if you run a home service business like painting contracting lawn care cleaning your to-do list is endless from hiring staff to mountains of paperwork, not to mention doing the actual work that pays the bills. Jobber is a mobile and online app that helps you organize your business and look professional. With Jobber, you can quote jobs, schedule your crew, invoice, and get paid all in one place. Try it free today at getjobber.com slash finehomebuilding. Well, I'm going to get to the question that I'm sure everyone is wondering by this point. So, why are the freaking costs so high and what can you do to protect your uh, business if you're a contractor or a small lumber yard to deal with these fluctuations that could suddenly make your estimate, you know, 10, 20 percent uh, under bid, right? Yeah. Uh, the, 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 so I, I think um, I think the first thing to point out is that there is no one silver bullet. There's probably many lead bullets. OK, so I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to um, I don't want to just uh, blaze over it and say like, this is what everyone needs to do. And like, that be the end all answer. Cause that's, that's just, uh, that's just Well, let's not start true. with the, why is stuff so expensive? It's because well, uh, demand, the, right? Yeah. Well, and supply. I mean, yeah. that's the thing is that like, that's, that's an easiest answer. The, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the supply chain right now is incredibly constrained. Okay. Containers cost more money than they ever have. Uh, trucking is costing more money than it ever has. Um, uh, to get things moving around is harder than it's been traditionally. That's number one. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in addition to the logistics, materials have been harder to come by. That's number two. And then you have the perfect storm and demand has been up. And because of all of those reasons, things, prices will rise. That's that's economics 101, right? I don't think I'm educating your your uh, your uh, listeners by, by saying that. So the question is, is, what can you do, right? And it depends on what we're talking about. Um, but I think the number one thing you can do is, um, and it doesn't have to just be Sherwood, obviously, but if you have partners in the business that are really looking at the market every single day, look for consultation. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, one of the things that we were that we were discussing with a dealer the other day is that prior to COVID, um, so let's just say 2019 to like 2012, when things were relatively stable. Our channel became very accustomed to a just-in-time inventory model where they didn't need to carry any inventory. They could order special, and the stuff came to them in a day or two. And, and quite frankly, th those were good times. Every, you know, the supply chain was good. The, everything kind of flowed freely. It worked well, and our dealers had what they needed to. When this supply chain disruption took place, I think the dealers, because everybody felt pain, but I think the dealers that felt the least amount of pain really rethought their buying habits uh, one of the conversations I had with the dealer yesterday, we, we sold them quite a bit of aluminum railing. I, 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 I likened it to lumber. You know, if I could sell you lumber at $350 per thousand today, how much would you buy? And the answer, is, the answer is, is right. Every stick that you'll sell. Me. And, and, and if you think about aluminum railing right now, we know that aluminum railing or not even aluminum railing, aluminum based products. They're going to experience three or four more price increases, likely throughout 2022. So you have to think about how you want to how you want to. So think how do about folks know that, Todd? Like, how do you guys know that uh, aluminum products will go up three or four times next this year? Well, you 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 look at how the commodity is moving. You 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 discuss with your what you discuss with your manufacturing partners and vendors, and you stay abreast of the of the industry trends as to what the growth looks like, and you, and you can get a pretty good feel from your manufacturers and from. Uh, from the market, what, what you need to do. And the fact is, is that every single time one of our guys is in the field talking, you know, it, it, there is a, there is a portion of the time that we want to make sales, but I think what gives us sales is the fact that we're willing to share this type of information with our customers. And that's, that's really what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to solve a need. You're trying to help, you're trying to help their business flow. And, and that's, that's the fact of the matter. So thinking about inventory potentially differently during a highly volatile time, Probably a good best practice right now. If you can find ways and times where the inventory makes sense to, to do it and you have the space, uh, there's probably there's probably a way that you'll be able to service your customers a little bit better than maybe you had in the past. Uh, and then the other thing that we always talk about is I believe that in 2022, I, because it was established in 2021, our uh, uh, our general base, by general base, I mean 
even homeowners, people that would not be familiar experts in the space are more accustomed to alternatives than they've ever been. So, so maybe you were looking for the market leading decking product. Maybe it's time to look at something else as well. There's lots of good products out there. There's lots of good things out there that are more than just a brand name. And, and one of the things that we're really trying to do over the course of the last two years is really take a hard stance and not only saying you should look at this, but educating as to why, showing the channel as to why. Um, to be new in building products, you have to be you have to be old for like 15 years, right? No, this this industry is so adverse to change. So we're seeing a dynamic kind of shift here a little bit where if you're willing to educate, you're willing to take time to help your 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 channel, your your contractor, your builder, your homeowner understand why these products are around. Uh, looking at alternatives is a good time to do right now. So Mike, uh, the the lumber yards that uh, or the dealers that are selling your products, do you hear from your reps that? Those counter salespeople or the salespeople on the other end are 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 people mad at them because of the price increases? Do they do they get uh, pushback from the contracts who are buying this stuff, thinking that they're getting rich? Uh, <laughs> no, I think I think what we kind of pride ourselves on in terms of you know professionals in the business is I think we try to take that proactive step to be that consultative advisor, right? So. To, to what Todd was alluding to earlier about like price increasing and, and things of that nature, we, we do our best to kind of stay out in front of it. And for the most part, you know, outside of something crazy happening, we, we most of our dealers are well in advance of knowing. I, I don't think that there's any kind of uh, underlying aggression towards like robber baron or like that we're just sitting back collecting fat checks. Because honestly, the truth is, is that we're stressing just as much as they are in order to be able to help fulfill the need. Right. And so, we want to be what we can be to our customers, which is a trusted source, a, a knowledge source for information and, a, and an avenue to be able to get the product that the customers are looking for. So I don't think that we've gotten a lot of flack for, for the price increases um, because it's, it's handled with tact and, and, yeah. and education and, and foresight. So it's not yeah. like it's just out of the blue. I you try and tell people ahead of time so they can prepare, right? It's like well, that's 100 uh, percent. Patrick, I bet your mom knows the cost of lumber is high. <laughs> right. Like, like, so like the fact of the matter is, is that like, I think even homeowners are expecting things to be more expensive. That just seems to be so like open and acknowledged. Oh, it's, right? it's mainstream media, so, right? It's so it's, yeah. yeah a thousand it's percent. news. Yeah. I, I assume that's part of the reason we are, we're we even talking right now, but the fact is, is that, uh, the customers are frustrated, the customer, everybody, but I don't think it's pointed. I think it's just, you know, when, when you, all we're all trying to do is help people build homes at the end of the day, like dream homes. Yeah. Right. And then there's emotions behind living in your dream home. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we really do see. We see a lot of frustrated people where we, you know, I, I can tell you the, the, the dealers, the lumber yards of the world, we see them trying their hearts out. It, it inspires us to try our hearts out. Uh, we're all dealing with a little bit more difficulties than we probably ever have. So I definitely can sense frustration, but it doesn't feel pointed to answer the question. So did you guys ever, all right, so I did counter sales at a lumber yard for a period of my life. And, uh, you know, the reps will come in with a new product once in a while, right? I'm sure the same thing happens to y'all. Uh, did anyone ever bring anything that was like a complete failure that you either brought in and it didn't work or just something that was like a non-starter because it was ugly or didn't uh, suit the need? I'm curious. Yeah, I want some, yeah, I want some yeah. dirt here. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the dirt. You ready? <laughs> It's yeah. very sel it's very seldom you run into a bad product between between the testing that you need to bring to marketplace and the uh, technology that's available. It's, it's hard to make a bad product. Here here's where we see things not work out. Um, not all manufacturers are created equal, um, and and typically where a product fails is because of a lack of vision or an ability to execute. And so when we're when we're interviewing manufacturers around whether or not we should be able to distribute. That understanding of, of, of what, what are you trying to get achieved, how do you think you can do it, and can you actually come through with what you say you want to do, that's more of a problem than the product was ugly or it was failing. or We don't see a lot of that, but what we do see sometimes is a lack of strategic vision to bring products to market. And so there's never a time where you know, we've, gotten, we've gotten relatively good at trying to, like all, like all companies should do in our space, is really interview the manufacturer and try and understand – what is their core focus? What are their core goals? And can they do what they're saying based on their their uh, capabilities? 
And and if if the answers check all the box for yes, it's usually a really nice marriage, and there's usually a a, a place for a lot of building products. Where where we see failure is when manufacturers decide not to take that extra step and trying to figure out who they want to be and why they want to be that and what they're willing to trade off in order to be that. That's where we tend to see, that's where we tend to see the failure. Hmm. So I'm going to ask you individually, uh, can you tell me about your house and do you use your own homes to test products that you're considering for distribution? I'm guessing you guys probably have outdoor railings everywhere, right? <laughs> yeah, it looks like a prison cell. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, so it's funny that you bring that up. Yes, um, my my house is in New Jersey, and it's it's wonderful, it's beautiful. As I mentioned earlier, I just did a kitchen and I added a deck. And yes, I did use uh, some of our decking products to be able to to, to skin that 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 area. And uh, I'm really excited about some of our stone veneer because it, you know you always seem to find a need. Right. That's one of the things that drive you crazy about being in this business is that you're always seeing really, really. Cool OK, so you have you this new stone veneer product and you're like, I got to have some of that. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. You rub your hands together. and You're like, man, that would look so good over here. <laughs> and so my wife probably rips her hair out half the time because I'm like, you know, what we just did like three years ago. We're going to change that now because I think I have to see something even cooler. So, yes, I, I, I am a definite early adopter. I, I believe in a lot of the things that we have. So. Um, Yes, I do integrate them into my own house. And Mike, sure. do you do the work yourself or do you pay other folks to do it? I am very lucky to have been swinging a hammer since I was 12 years old. I come oh, from a contracting cool. background. Yeah, my whole family's basically been in construction. So it was always the summer job or the spring break thing or whatever it was. And, and you hated it in the moment. But looking back on it now as a homeowner, I'm super appreciative for it. So do you enjoy uh, I do it now? most of it myself. Do I enjoy it now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When there's not a time crunch and you can really kind of take your time and, and see yourself through it. Absolutely. I like to do it now. Um, for sure. Yeah. What about you, Todd? You a DIYer? I'm the exact opposite. I am shiny <laughs> shoes, not dirty boots. And, and, further, and, and, further, and furthermore, as a transplant from Illinois, I've only owned my house for a year and my wife is not pulling her hair out because she is making me do a master uh, bathroom and the kitchen before I get to do all the fun stuff that I want to do. Uh, but is that uh, in process now or is that, that, that coming that, up? So to so talk about the supply chain disruption, we're doing our master bathroom right now, but we're waiting 24 weeks for our cabinets. Wow. So is your bathroom all torn apart or are you just waiting to get it into it before you can get your cabs? No, we're, we're right now we, we put down all the down payments on the materials and we're just waiting for stuff to show up so we can rip it all down. So what was your yeah. lead time again? We're waiting 24 weeks on the on the cabinets right now, if you can believe that. I don't know if that's a lead time, more as like a, a different period of history. I don't know, a half a year, right? It's, it's, <laughs> in, it's, it's incredible, um, but I think it speaks to the challenges that we're facing today. I, I don't want to suggest to your listeners that that's the lead time for all cabinets. Uh, the, oh, I've, you'll, I've you'll, heard you'll, worse. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see. I, I've heard better too, but either yeah. way. It's a it's a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge to uh, do projects. That being said, uh, if I tried to do it myself, that wouldn't probably go so hot. <laughs> <laughs> Are you having trouble getting other stuff too, Todd, for your bathroom model? The cabinets tend to be the hardest. Um, that's that's what we're really struggling with. Uh, the followed up by the uh, like the the shower head stuff. Uh, that seems to be the second hardest. But uh, from an interior perspective, we didn't struggle with the stone or the glass or the tile uh, cabinetry and the uh, and the uh, aesthetic kind of knobs are what's kind of been holding us up. What about uh, did you have difficulty finding a qualified contractor to do the work? Well, the, that's uh, so for us, we're very fortunate, right? Because we work with so many dealers who we can get references from. So I was very fortunate in having a, a, someone that I, I know had done A, work in my neighborhood, and B, was re recommended by a, a trusted partner of ours. And so for us, that was a slam dunk. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, to all your homeowners listening out there, it's, it's important to vet your contractor and make sure you're getting someone that can do high quality to the level that you expect. Amen. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Uh, is there anything you'd like to tell our audience before we part company? Uh, this year is going to be fraught with volatility. Uh, highs will be highs, lows will be low. The The number one thing I would tell your listeners is uh, pay attention to the market this year. If you're in the trade, there are going to be unique opportunities. 
to uh, uh, to purchase inventory and to supply the market if, if that'll be better than others this year. There's not going to be a, a, a high cost of building products or a low cost of building products, but there will be a very volatile market. And, and with volatility, there is opportunity if you're willing to put in the work to find it. Mm. Yeah. Buy low, sell high. And yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I would kind of double down on that and, and use your, your contractors and your contractors should use their dealers and their dealers should talk to their trusted advisors and really kind of get the lay of the land. Because to Todd's point with the volatility, what we're going to see is, is a lot of ups and downs and right opportunity and good times and probably not so advantageous times to be able to kind of source your products and your materials. Um, one way to do that, I'm going to do a little bit of a shameless plug here is follow Sher Sherwood Lumber on LinkedIn. Uh, we do our best to kind of give industry updates, volatility concerns, product outages. We try to really kind of keep the market educated through our social platform. So Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn is really the place to be able to find Sherwood Lumber. Very good. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Todd London and Mike Glowacki for joining us. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Buy low, sell high. <laughs>